Hi there, and welcome to Inside the Wooniverse, a podcast brought to you from the corner of Fringe and Maine. I'm your host, Colette Baron reed Joining us today is my friend, Miss Moonology herself, Yasmin Boland. You know, Yasmin was once a journalist and a TV producer, and then 20 years ago, after a couple of well-timed eclipses, Yasmin turned into an award-winning astrologer and Sunday Times best-selling Hay House author. Yasmin is the author of Astrology Made Easy, the Mercury Retrograde book that everyone must have, and my favorite, Moonology, Working with the Magic of Lunar Cycles, both the book and the fantastic, fantastic Oracle card deck. Now, she is dedicated to teaching her readers and fellow travelers on the spiritual path how to use astrology as a very special way to connect with the divine. Welcome to the Wooniverse, Yasmin. Why, thank you, Colette. So great to have you here. Now, let's get started. We love a good origin story on the podcast, so I want to go back to the beginning. You are so interesting. You were born in Germany to Maltese and English-Irish parents, and then you were raised in Tasmania. So what was your childhood like? And were you always interested in the woo and unseen influences? Yes, I was. But so half of my family came from the island of Malta in the Mediterranean, which, uh, by the way, is said by many to be the home of the goddess. It's another story. Um, But it's an extremely Catholic country. And uh, so my mom and my dad were both the children of extremely religious people. And anything kind of woo as I was growing up was considered to be quite borderline, if you like. Uh, And I remember, you know, whenever I talked to my mom about, you know, psychic ability or ESP or anything like that, uh, she would always say, oh, Yasmin, there's a fine line between that and <laughs> madness. <laughs> and my dad, was a, my dad was a psychiatrist, so I took that extremely seriously. So it wasn't really until I left home. Um, mm-hmm. Although, funnily enough, as I'm talking to you, I'm remembering this thing I used to do when I was still at school, which was I'd go to this girlfriend's house and we'd have a sleepover. And she had a very big bedroom and we'd have, be in separate single beds and we would like try and transmit ideas to each other so I probably would have been about 14 or so when I did that and we actually had amazing amazing success with our telepathy yeah but it wasn't really until I left home I actually went through quite a religious stage with the church because I was obviously I know I look back now I know I was seeking spirituality Mm -hmm. couldn't really get on with that because I didn't really agree with a lot of things in the church like you know, not being able to get divorced if your husband beat you or something. Um, And eventually, around that time when I was first working, I remember I used to be very interested in astrology and I would buy magazines based on how good their stars were. And it's kind of been a very gradual evolution. Um, But it, it took a while for the universe to kind of whack me on the head. I do actually still have a clipping from an article I wrote uh, during that time when I was first a journalist in Tasmania where um, uh, I went to a Chinese medicine doctor um, sort of to do a story but, you know, treated the whole thing like a bit of a joke and uh, Mm -hmm. I remember hearing at at one point when I was in that first job out of university um, I got shingles which is, you know, so kind of I don't know exactly what it is, but people. I have it. I, I ah, get it. Yeah. Okay. Exactly well, it, you it know, it's a lot to do with stress, which I now mm-hmm. understand. But I remember at that point as well going to the chemist, and the the chemist must have been the pharmacist must have been quite woo woo himself, <laughs> and he said, "Well, you know, uh, shingles is caused by stress." And I'm like, "What? You're crazy!" And like, pretty much ran out of there thinking, oh, my God, as if my mental state has anything to do with my physical state. So I was, it took a long time. And it really wasn't until I started meditating uh, not that long after my Saturn return that I really got on the path. Right. And your Saturn return is 27, 28? Yeah, or 29 20. to 31. Okay, 29 to 31. Perfect. So You talk about your life changing in 2005. Now, I know we're like really fast forwarding, although you're, you're, you know, like in 2005, that's a big, big time for you. Let's talk about how that changed you. What happened in 2005, I'd already begun a moon practice. I mean, sort of was incorporating it into my journalism and starting to write about it and starting to do 
moon workshops in cafes and so on, just not for money, just literally for private interest. And uh, basically in 2005, I was living in Paris, France, and I was, but I was back in Australia. I was in a cafe. I had five weeks where neither the flat that I was in, in in Australia nor the flat in Paris was available. So I had five weeks with nowhere to live basically. And I, and I was having a conversation in a cafe. Someone overheard me and said, you should go to India. I was like, okay, maybe, why not? And it, it was someone I vaguely knew and I looked into it and there was this ashram uh, called the Sri Narayani Pedam where I just was two weeks ago. Uh, and this was 17 years ago, um, 18 years ago. So I went to this ashram and everything changed, like my whole life changed. I was going to go for five days. I ended up staying for five weeks. And I basically learned, I think, about surrender and surrendering to the divine. I think that my kind of so-called new age studies had very much led me down the path of understanding that we create our own reality and understanding that uh, we are in charge of our own destiny, so to speak. Um, but I think I'd become a little bit too much, uh, in my opinion, too much thinking I was doing it myself, like I command right. the universe, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that kind of thing. <laughs> Right. And a lot of people think that. So yeah, yeah. this is good. This is a good and, conversation. And also, you know, things like, you know, Wayne Dyer, um, who is obviously completely amazing and is, you know, one of the people who's totally influenced my my journey. But he would talk about the, the whole I am, you know, and and I think I got so fascinated by the way all that worked. But when I went to India that first time in 2005, what I realized was that um, we are co-creating with the divine. Mm -hmm. And I had somehow forgotten that or, you know, maybe I'd been so badly burned by the church uh, situation, you know, and I kind of moved away from it. So I went to India, um, decided I wanted to get married came home, got off the plane, made the phone call that led to meeting my husband, Olivier, and six wait, months wait, later, wait, wait, wait. Yeah, okay, yeah. Wait. <laughs> it was like it, everything changed. Like when I say everything changed, everything changed. And I believe it's because I surrendered. Mm -hmm. Okay. You can't just slide over, <laughs> made the phone call. Okay. So what does that even mean? So, so what happened? Okay. So I, I want to, you surrendered, but there had to have been also some form of surrendering to the who, surrendering to the how. So how, wh how did that phone call lead to meeting? Okay. Well, I'll, I'll just tell you a little story about what happened because it is a, it is a really good story if I do say so myself. So what happened was that I don't know if it's in Canada or States or England or whatever. In Australia, there was this psychic person called Tatiana and she had this book out called Tatiana's Oracle, which I was walking through a department store one day and I opened it up and it was probably 10 years earlier than, than 2005, so however long ago that was. And I opened the book up and I was like, oh, what do you do? Okay. So I said, okay, when will I get married? I wasn't particularly keen to get married. It was just the question that popped in my head. <laughs> And I did the thing and it said, when you are 62, and I'm like, oh, my God, that's a bloody long time to wait, excuse my language. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I had it in my head that I, you know, like, and I'd also been to see a psychic that I found in the back of Tatler magazine here in London who basically said, oh, you're not going to get married for a long time if you ever get married. And I was like, so in my head I was kind of not going to get married. And when I went to the ashram, I decided, you know what, I actually think I'm ready to get married now. I want to get married. Uh, you know, I want to find my life partner was, was really the thing. And, um, and somehow without telling anyone at the ashram about this experience I'd had with Tatiana's oracle saying I was going to get married when I was 62, somebody said to me, oh, if you want to get married, you should do the marriage advancement ceremony. And I'm like, oh, what's the marriage advancement ceremony? And they said, oh, every, um, every Friday night uh, you just go down to the temple. There's a guy there. He's got six limes which have had the, the flesh scooped out of them. With, put, you put ghee in there and a little wick and you have this tray of nine candles, of like these lime candles, and you go around the temple and you say, Om Namo Narayani 
three times at every statue or Namona Rani. I didn't even know what it meant at the time. It means I surrender to the divine or I surrender to the divine mother. So, and, uh, and that will advance your marriage because for them, uh, you know, in India, I was already completely on the shelf because, you know, in India, you need to get married quite young or you're, you know, you're out of the game. So off I went and I did the, did the thing, went around the temple, I think nine times, did the Om Namo Narayanis, how many times, got back, that was fine, as I said, got back to Paris, got on the phone, made a phone call to a girlfriend who from, as a result of that phone call, uh, took me to a, a party where I met my husband. And so my sister saw all this and was going, wow, this is amazing. Like you just, you know, you did this marriage advancement ceremony and now you've met the love of your life because, and six months later I was, I was pregnant. And she said, I'm going to India. So she flew <laughs> to I love India. <laughs> she flew to India, at, God bless her, and seeks out the woman who told me about this woman called Vidya um, at the ashram. And she goes, right, look, my sister did the marriage advancement ceremony. Can I do it, please? And Vidya goes, what? What are you talking about? And she goes, you know, you go to the temple on a Friday, there's an old guy there, he's got the tray of limes, and you go around the temple. She's like, I literally have no idea what you're talking about. So that was my very cosmic way of getting married. <laughs> because I think wow. I, had to, I had to break this belief that uh -huh. I was, wasn't going to get married till I was 62. And there's a lot of magic that goes on at this ashram. And I don't think I'd even told anyone about my Tatiana's Oracle thing. Um, but somehow the magic happened. So it was a very cosmic time. Wow. Yeah. Do you know what's really interesting? I remember that because it was a book where you had to match like a rope with a thing and then a, that, like yes. it was a weird It was book. Like, like that. You, and it was sort of like, a, right? you know, when you do a graph or something and you had to. Yeah. yeah. And you look up a page and then you go to the other one. It was like really complicated. And I remember looking at it and it also told me some, in, some things that were like, what? Well, but I that was, was not correct. Yeah, no, nah, same with me. But I was told by a very well-known psychic early in my 20s that I would that I would never have a faithful partner, oh, not get wow. married. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Never get married and that never be really successful that I would, you know, that this lifetime wow. I'd have wow. to come back next time. And I and I'm going to tell you that haunted me. Like yeah. that was just yeah. the back of my head. Somebody said that to me, like, what? And then yeah. when I got clean and sober 37 years ago, like I just decided I'm not listening to any of those things. Like yeah. I'm, I'm going to become the person that can have a really healthy relationship and all that. And yeah. It took a long time for me to do that. But yeah, I also co-created a different reality just like you. Yeah. And I also yeah. think that because you had your addiction problem and yep. then you sur surmounted it, yep. you know, got rid of it you possibly did change your course. Oh, 100%. Because I would have ended up exactly the way they said. But yeah. it was just the point that I, yeah. I think the commonality that we shared is that there was that sense that someone told us that thing that we're like, no, yeah. you know, and I'm going to surrender this and to have something else. And I, I do a lot of, uh, I have a lot of emails I, and I have had for years where I'm kind of, you know, breaking these curses that people have put on people right. that they they think they're destined to be, you know, whatever. Um, you know, someone said that you know their husband was going to leave them eventually or whatever. So you have to try and help people to see we are creating our reality. And I do honestly think, you know, I know it's hard to believe or understand, but I truly believe that on some level, my teacher in India knew I had this negative belief um, mm -hmm. around around my my marriage or marriageability and somehow that just broke it so you mm -hmm. know anyone who's listening who's been given any negative predictions know number one that whoever made the prediction doesn't really have much integrity because you should never say anything that's going to make someone feel doomed agreed right feel doomed exactly agreed you know that's like i think rule number one is don't yeah. ever you know don't don't put things like that in people's uh, heads and you know number two if there are challenges because obviously as an astrologer if I look at someone's chart you know even we had a period when you were having a Pluto transit or as I right? recall and, and you know you worked with it so even if you do have you know Saturn on your sun or Pluto squaring your Venus or whatever it's a challenge that you either do or don't rise to you're never doomed and you and anyone who tells you you're doomed you know, they're, they're, they're just scammers, basically.
risk. <laughs> they probably I totally want to cross their that. palm with silver so they can make it all go away. No, I 100% agree with you. And that the way in which we approach somebody when we talk about this is to say, hey, there's a challenge around this. And these this is how you would change your viewpoint on it. Even like you say to somebody, you're being invited to take a look at this from a different perspective. That's how I couch it. In astrology, the first thing that people ask is, oh my God, when's it over? And it's like, nah, you, really? you actually want to work with it, you know? <laughs> Don't just wish it away. It's happening for a reason because your soul needs this lesson, you know, but here are some ways to work with it. I had to make Pluto my boyfriend for a while. And it, and yeah, and it's I'm still recognizing some of the lessons and how much I had to change as a result of it. It was really profound. I don't regret any of it. It was hard. You really helped me too. Oh, thank you. I can say hand on heart, Colette, hand on heart. I don't want to touch the microphone, but hand on heart. I have never in 20 plus years of doing astrology, I've never met anyone who rose to the occasion and the transit better because we all get difficult transits from time to time. I've never met anyone who worked as consciously as you did with that challenging transit. So thumbs up to you. Bless you. Okay, true. now let's talk true. about. Thank you. Let's talk about what you're really famous for, which is even though you are an award winning astrologer, you say that you don't need to believe in astrology to work with the moon. And the moon really is a connection to the goddess. And I think that's really what I, I think that's the thread that you offer everybody. So let's start at the very beginning. When did you start working with the moon specifically? And where did you learn the practices you teach? I want to go back in time again, because I know that we're further ahead, yeah. but let's go back. So we, we, we're going back to uh, the end of last century. So probably about 25 years ago, um, the ni 98, 99, around then, maybe 97, I'd learned to meditate that changed my life again. And I was dabbling in astrology with a friend who was an astrologer. And uh, she and I were talking one afternoon and I said, oh, what about the moon? Like how does the moon fit into all of this? And she was like, oh, don't worry about the moon. It's too complicated. <laughs> and honestly, you know, you may or may not be surprised to hear that that was like a red rag to a bull for me. I was like, <laughs> okay, now I have to find out everything about the moon. And funny yeah. enough, uh, so then I went off and I started to, to look into it and um, I ended up getting hold of a book called New Moon Astrology by Jan Spiller, who unfortunately oh, passed away. Oh, I love away. Jan Spiller. Yeah, mm. beautiful woman. And she, she passed away a few years ago, but she wrote a couple of really amazing books or maybe three or four actually. And I remember seeing it on Amazon and just ordering it and just being on tenterhooks for it to arrive. And so that started to get, uh, introduce me to the idea of making new moon wishes and setting intentions. And then as I looked into it, I realised that uh, new moon wishes and intention setting is something that's literally millennia old and is something that women especially have done, you know, for thousands of years. Here in England, they do it out, you know, in Dartmoor and Glastonbury. It's just a really, really old tradition. And so I read a lot around the subject of the astrology of it, you know, why it's the start of a new cycle, why women have traditionally done this, about witches and Wicca. And of course, this challenged the Catholic me that, you know, was like, <laughs> oh my God, you know, witches, am I, uh, what am I doing? Um, and and I kind of, I kind of went into it like that. And really what happened was that I started to see that it worked. Um, and, you know, even with my journalist hat on and my, and I was still kind of writing as a journalist, but I was writing more and more new agey type articles. But with my journalist hat on, my TV presenters, my I mean, TV producers hat on, I, you know, I investigated it and I, I literally found it worked. And at one point I found a wish list that I'd made a year earlier um, and literally everything on there had come true. And I was like, this is really extraordinary. So that's why I started to um, do things like holding new moon wishing workshops in cafes around Bondi Beach in Sydney, Australia, uh -huh. just because I wanted to share it because I'm just a communicator. I love to share things. And so I started to hold these 
coffee shops literally for no reason. There was no no gain to me per se. But of course, it's one of those things where you do it for no gain and then you do have a gain and and the whole thing just took off and and then eventually I I ended up having a column about astrology in Australia for many years and and then the full moon practice really came out of my travels in India um, where the full moon is huge and the ashram that I go to is uh, is the Sri Narayani Pedam and Narayani is the triple goddess made up of Lakshmi, Saraswati and Durga three goddesses and um, so that connected me to the goddess and also connected me to the full moon and the whole practice was you know in my life for probably more than a decade and a half before I then eventually wrote the book for Hay House. Right and you are also a cancer so you're now you're naturally aligned with the moon as am I so I know. It's that- and for any astrologers out there my moon is conjunct my MC. And that means basically I was hard-coded to do this. Um, The MC is your career line and it's what you're known for and my moon is bang on my MC. So anyone out there who understands astrology would be going, (laughs) ah, that makes total sense. Is your MC cancer? Uh, The MC is the the career line that that runs. You can call it, right? Yeah, exactly. And uh, mine's in Capricorn. Oh, yeah. Oh, even better. Uh, So, oh. Well, there you go. Yes, of course. I know I'm, I'm loving the Capricorn energy. I'm my progressed moon is about to enter Capricorn and Ooh. I'm feeling very businessy. Interesting. <laughs> very good. Very good. Okay. So, um, I actually just told, uh, my, my masterclass, uh, that for Hay House all about your deck that I, uh, you know, that I'll use mine, but then I'll use yours too. So that I want to talk about moonology and how you created it. Um, so working with the moon, because really moonology is the, is the title of moon of working with the moon, right? So, um, let's speak about how we create reality with the moon. So so let's go into those. uh, Okay. So as I studied astrology from kind of just the last part of last century and just, I I got very obsessed with astrology uh, very quickly. And um, around about the same time I was learning about the law of attraction. And I feel like the law of attraction was becoming more and more well known around the end of last Mm -hmm. century, around say 97, 98, 99. Certainly that's around the time I think I did a meditation course around 95, 96. The woman there was telling us that we create our own reality. So I'd had a lot of sort of information about this idea that we create our own reality, uh, probably I'd say by 96, 97. And then I was learning astrology. And then I was kind of like trying to navigate that idea that astrology, you know, talking about being doomed, you know, can doom you to stuff. You know, ancient astrology was extremely fatalistic. So it was sort of like, you know, um, I mean, I'm not even joking, you know, like when this happens, there'll be a plague of pests upon your house or stuff like that, or, you know, you will die in a, in a seafaring accident or something like that. And that just didn't sit well with me. So even though I tested astrology, because my first teacher always said, test it, test it, test it, that was her mantra. Um, I had tested it and I knew it worked. I also knew that making new moon wishes work. So what I started to do is I started to look at how can you actually use what's going on in your chart as an opportunity to create your reality. And uh, and I actually ended up doing a couple of talks um, at the, I can't remember now, I think it was the New South Wales Astrological Association or the Australian Astrological Association. I did a couple of talks which was really important for me because astrologers take their craft very seriously, as they should. And um, I knew that I was kind of veering off a bit to a slightly uncharted way of uh, looking at astrology and then coming up with the idea of moonology and the new moon and the full moon, working with the new moon and the full moon, essentially stripping out the rest of the astrology. And... um, so I did a couple of talks called um, Astrology and the Law of Attraction. Um, are they good bedfellows? In other words, do they go together? <laughs> yeah, and I, I think in a good way, problem. looking back, it was my way of testing the water with my astrological peers, so to speak, because, they, you know, some of them are very intimidating, formidable people who, you know, done things like, I don't know, gone and, you know, learned Hebrew and so they could read. <laughs> 
bits of papyrus that, and all these things right. on the, you know old astrology on them so they're quite serious learned academic about astrology people maybe don't understand that it gets there is this end of very academic very serious stuff so getting up in front of some of these people and talking about uh, moonology or astrology in the moon and the law of attraction I think in a way was my way of seeing did I get any pushback and I didn't um in fact most people absolutely loved it and wanted more and you know so it kind of grew from there I grew in confidence that what I was talking about even though nobody had really done it particularly you know in earnest before I started to realize that it had legs and that it was useful and and mm-hmm. you know that was basically what led to it and funnily enough the same teacher um who said to me oh don't worry about the moon um you know it's too complicated in fact a couple of years later we were talking again and um and I said you know what what about moonology it's like astrology but it's moonology and it's genius and she cocked yeah, her head to one side she was quite psychic she was a medium as well as an astrologer and she <laughs> she went like this and she went oh remember that it's really important <laughs> I was like, okay and so I actually then went and got the url um moonology.com um and you know again it just all sort of grew very very organically I mean I still had one foot in journalism and you know it just went from there really no it's just genius it really is it's genius because it's it is there's nothing like it anywhere in the world and it really is and it works and it really does work and it really does work now let's actually show people how it works because a lot of people may be going well how does it work how does it work we want to know so um let's speak about some aspects of the moon we could look at when getting started um what's the difference between a lunar phase and the sign the moon is in at any particular time all right okay so let's start by just putting it in context in fact if you're watching and rather as opposed to listening on the podcast you can see i've got the moons behind me so what you can see there above my head is the full moon we all know what the full moon looks like and then on either side it's not quite full and then it gets smaller until we get down to the sliver so they're the moon phases so we get the new moon which is actually excuse me, you cannot see the moon when the moon is new. We've just had the new moon at the time of recording this. And then we get the uh, first sliver becomes apparent and which way it faces depends if you're in the northern or the southern hemisphere. But we get the first sliver of the moon where you go, oh, look, the moon, the crescent moon. Um, And then you get the half moon, which is in astrology is either the first or the last quarter moon. Uh, And you get all these eight phases But I used to work with that, um, but over the years I've realised people don't even need to know all of that. They can learn all that if they do my, you know, moonology courses or whatever. They learn about all the phases, but you don't need to know all the phases. At the risk of sounding like my teacher who said, don't worry, it's too complicated. Um, (laughs) Um, You really just need to know about the new moon and the full moon. But to answer your question, so the moon, so so we're on planet Earth, obviously, going around the sun, and the moon is going around planet Earth. So as we go around the sun, the moon goes around us. And so all the phases are created by the relation of the moon to the sun because it's obviously shadows. The moon isn't really taking t- changing mm-hmm. shape or anything. And so as we go around the Earth, Uh, Sorry, as we go around the sun, you know, and the sun then moves through all the different signs, um, then we get um, we get the moon will then go through all the different signs as well. So one month you might have uh, the new moon in Taurus or the next month you'll have the new moon in Gemini and by the same token you might have the quarter moon in Um, you know, Scorpio or whatever. So the phase and the sign don't have anything to do with each other in a way. The moon is always in one phase or another and the moon is always in one sign or another and there's no kind of way to tie them up. You just need to start to follow the moon. You'll start to see, okay, well, right now the moon is in, you know, whatever sign it's in. I should know that right now, shouldn't I? So let's actually go through sign by sign what the what the different lunar aspects are. What are the flavors of those signs, for example, for a person who has no clue about what these are? 
Okay, so one thing to mention at this point is we are talking about the moon up in the skies because the moon is all is always moving, always changing shape and size and always mm-hmm. going through the different signs. It spends about two and a bit days is the way astrologers right. describe it in each sign, about two and a bit days. Yep. So at the time of recording this, actually, the moon is in Taurus, which is a a good thing so as the moon goes through the different signs a baby for example being born right now because there'll be a baby being born right now somewhere in the world will have on their horoscope chart the moon in Taurus because that's where the moon is right now but I'm not actually talking about what we call natal astrology astrology of of your chart we're looking at the transiting moon so the moon in the skies right now now Over the years, I've studied it and I've gone, you know, how much influence does the moon have? Because the moon goes in Aries, then Taurus, then Gemini, then Cancer, Leo, Virgo, Libra, Scorpio, Sag, Capricorn, Aquarius and Pisces. It goes through all the 12 signs over the course of a month, also known as a moon. The word month comes from the moon because it takes a month (laughs) for the moon to go around. So, you know, when the moon is in Aries, you know, if you are very tuned into the moon, you will feel it, uh, but otherwise it could just pass you by. So moon in Aries, it's the moon is very much in astrology about feelings, emotions, and uh, just what you need. So moon in Aries, people are going to be speedier. They're going to need to get things done because it's um, a very, it's a fire sign. It's a very fast sign. Mm-hmm. Next sign, Taurus. Well, the moon is also about food. Taurus is a very foody sign, so it might be a day when you just feel like you want more carbohydrates or it might be a day where, <laughs> because Taurus is steady, it might be a day when you, st- you start to feel your emotions settling down or, you know, just to kind of flip it before we do the rest of the signs, you know, if you were looking for a day when things are likely to be a little bit calmer, then a Taurus day, moon day is going to be a bit calmer than Aries moon day, but you do also have to take into account what the planets are doing. Moon in Gemini, very chatty, great night for a party or, you know, a, an event where everyone has to communicate. It's, Gemini is a very chatty sign uh, and a good night, a time to talk about your feelings um, to an extent as well because the moon is, is very emotional. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, moon in Cancer, well, that's sort of like a perfect match. Uh, the moon is all about home and family and Cancer is all about home and family. It's one of um, the moon's two home signs along with Taurus. So, you know, if you're looking for what night am I going to spend at home with my family next week? Oh, it's a cancer moon. Do it that night. And again, this is very broad brush strokes. And if you, you know, you do need to look at what the planets are doing as well if you want to really, you know, if it's crucial. Really get it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Moon in Leo. Leo's the showy sign. So, you know, it's a time when people are going to like be more willing to put themselves out there and kind of strut their stuff, show the world what they've got. Moon in Virgo, Virgo is um, reliable, modest, chaste and uh, likes to sort of get everything sorted. So great day to do your filing, you know, get your house in order, literally or metaphorically. Uh, Moon in Libra, Libra is the sign of relationships. So it can be a very good time to um, deal with any relationship issues. Uh, Not a bad night to go out on a date, especially including a first date. Very much about love and romance. Scorpio, well, look, one of my mentors, Jonathan Kainer, who was very well known here in the UK, didn't agree with this, but most of us say Scorpio is the sexy sign, very sexy sign. So when the moon's in Scorpio, good night for, you know, another kind of date night um, or, you know, just a sexy night. Uh, Moon in Sag, Sag, Sagittarius is, is the adventurer, so it's a time where you're going to feel more emotionally free, you know, moon in Cancer, it's very all feelings and could be a bit needy. Mm-hmm. Sag is like, way I'm off to see the world. Um, <laughs> moon in Capricorn, as you said, very good for business. Uh, business minded, making plans, being strategic, getting things, um, getting, making sure that everything's ticking along as it, as it needs to. Uh, moon in Aquarius is a quite a good one actually because the moon is quite clingy and needy and you know um, very much like you know, oh, I need a hug. But Aquarius is very um, not standoffish 
exactly, but almost. It can be a bit aloof. It can be a bit cold. You know, sort of think of steel or something like that. It's a bit mm-hmm. like that sometimes. Not in a bad way. It's not not an offence. We all got Aquarius in our chart somewhere, but it's mm-hmm. not clingy. So, in fact, I always feel like the Moon in Aquarius is an opportunity to kind of detach from a situation and kind of be a little mm-hmm. bit more, you know, like rational about what the heck's going on mm-hmm. here. Um, and then we have the moon in Pisces and Pisces is a very gentle sign, very romantic, likes, a, likes a, a drink, um, and likes a bit of poetry. It's about soulmates. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's more of a gentle night with your lover or, you know, a good friend or something like that. But I, I'm just going to say one more time, do understand that if you want to start to just work with the moon through the signs, it's important to um, keep your eye on the astrology, which, you know, if you don't know astrology, sure. um, you know, apart from I obviously have a book for it, <laughs> um, astrology <laughs> made easy, let me give it a plug. Yep. Uh, but, you know, even on Facebook or Instagram or whatever, you know, just keep an eye because yep. it's not solely dependent on where the moon is on any given day. So when we, when you work with the moon, what's the difference between a wish and an intention? So we're, we've, we know what the flavors of the moon are, and, and like you said. So now if you're looking at new moon and full moon astrology, you are going to be looking at the moon through the signs because you're looking at the new moon in, say right now the moon, new moon is in Pisces. So how would you work with this new moon, and what's the difference between a wish and an intention in your view? Yeah. So um, first of all, let's just say with every new moon, there are three ways to work with it. The number one way to work with a new moon that's really simple, requires absolutely no astrological knowledge whatsoever, is just to make wishes or set intentions. And I'll answer your question about that in a second, okay? The second way is work with the sign it's in. So as you say, we've just had the new moon in Pisces. So then you're you're going to look at things like, you know, how can I bring more poetry into my life, literally or metaphorically? How can I bring more uh, romance into my life? How can I deepen my spiritual practice? All the Piscean themes are up on offer. Mm -hmm. Um, And then the third way is to actually look at where in your chart it's taking place because Ah. your horoscope chart, you know, I... I mean, I could call your chart up right now um, sure. if I've got it on here, which I may or may not have. Um, oh, I haven't, I haven't got it on here. But um, do you know which house? Anyway, all you need to do, do is work which out house? which house yeah. Pisces rules. So say if it's your love zone, the then house. your which? Sixth. Sixth house. Okay, so the sixth house, yeah. it well done, is to, do with, um, <laughs> is to do with daily life and health. So mm-hmm. when you get the new moon in there once a year, which you, you will get sometimes twice, uh, you, it's a time to say, okay, so I'm setting my intentions and making my wishes just on something that I want to do with the fact that it's the new moon in Pisces, but also to do with my daily work and health because that's what it's triggering in my chart. So, you know, I'm going to change my routines and I'm going to take better care of my health or I'm going to drink more water or I'm going to cut out those carbs or whatever it is that you want to do, yeah. do sixth house stuff. So there are those three ways to work with the moon. Just make a wish, look at the sign that the new moon is in and uh, look at where in your chart it's triggering. Um, And you can just do one, you can do two, you can do all three of the methods. As to the question of the difference between a wish and an intention, so I initially started to only do new moon wishes and um, I believe that that wishes work because uh, it's all about um, our feelings and uh, you know, the moon is obviously the perfect conduit for wishes because the moon is also about feelings. And mm. um, so, yeah, so you want to, like, make wishes from the heart, which is why when, you're, when, when I teach about making wishes, it's about visualising it and feeling it. Uh, mm. As Wayne Dyer and Neville Goddard before him said, feel the feeling of the wish fulfilled. So if you make a wish from the heart, it can manifest. But Mm -hmm. I realised along the way that um, some people, when they hear the word wish, it sort of reminds them of when they were five, blowing out the candles on a birthday cake or something. Um, And, you know, it it seemed a bit airy-fairy. And people didn't really necessarily understand, um, you know, if you wish from your heart, it's, it's like sending a 
you know, what Abraham Hicks would call a rocket of desire out into the universe. And it's extremely powerful. But I realised that not everybody was able to understand that a wish can be that powerful. Um, so I, I then started to talk about setting intentions because uh, some people are just more comfortable with that. Um, and actually it works really well at the new moon as well because it's the restart. And that's why I say even if you don't mm -hmm. believe in astrology, if once a month you set your intentions for your life, your life is going to change, you know. So mm -hmm. make a wish, I set agree. your intentions. And the other one that I suggest, and this came from a workshop I, I did once, is um, make commitments to yourself. So you can yeah. make wishes, you can set intentions, or you can make commitments. It doesn't really matter. Um, the point is the more I've worked with moonology over the past 20-plus years, the more I realise that the new moon aside from the fact that it has traditionally been seen as the time when the veil between the worlds is at its thinnest. Mm -hmm. So it's the best time to send your wishes out into the world. And that has has been the tradition for thousands of years. It's also really powerful um, because once a month, if you get clarity about what you want, then you will therefore be far more likely to take action or inspired action towards your goals so and again this gets back to why I say you don't need to believe in astrology for this stuff to work mm -hmm. it just works because once you know what you want you're actually more likely to take steps towards doing whatever it is you have to do to achieve it so with that in mind then what does the full moon how does it factor in with this well, I'm glad you asked, Colette, <laughs> <laughs> because it's actually really, really important as well. So you've got the new moon and you've got two weeks of the waxing cycle and then you get the full moon. And then you've got two weeks of the waning cycle, you get another new moon. So in the waxing cycle between new moon and full moon, go for it. The full moon is when we offer it all up to the divine. And this is something I learned in India uh, and comes back to the whole idea of co-creating with, with the divine and the universe or source or whatever you want to call it. You Whatever hasn't happened by the time of the full moon, offer it up to spirit, offer it up to the divine, offer it up to source. And somehow I was made to realise in India that this is actually the secret to manifesting. So people think it's mm. all about setting intentions. They think it's all about making wishes. It's all about what you do at New Moon. And I honestly, after 20 plus years of doing this, I don't think it is. I think that that is about getting clarity and taking action. Mm -hmm. But somehow surrender is the secret source. But I always say source, S-O-U-R-C-E. It's the secret yeah, right. source of our manifesting power. So that's mm -hmm. what I teach in Moonology. It's like set your intentions offer it up to the divine, set your intentions, offer up the divine. Up, it yep. honestly mm -hmm. is the magical formula. And, you know, you and I are both on the same path and we're yep. both learning as we go. And I can't remember who I was with the other day. Someone was saying to me, you know, we were talking about manifesting. And I said, I still am amazed when, when things manifest. Me too. Yeah. Me and, too. I, it's like, me too. and I said, I think it's because we're taught from such a young age, you know, magic isn't real, fairies don't exist. I mean, I don't know anything about fairies, to be honest, but, you know, <laughs> nothing nothing is real, uh, nothing woo-woo is real. And so you still like, see, it works. <laughs> I'm never, ever going to be any different. I'm always in awe. I'm always shocked and surprised. I'm never jaded about this ever. Because but why it are we still surprised after all these years? It's weird. Yeah, because I think it makes it fun. It's like, wow. Because I think also we we tend to forget because the world conditions us to fall yeah. asleep at the wheel, right? And and then every and then we get awakened right away, like, wow. You know, and I also feel like these are like these gifts that we can celebrate so that they feel very celebratory. Yeah, yeah. I just, I, <laughs> I find it, I still find it absolutely fascinating. And, and I do think it's because we're conditioned by the world and because, you know, I think that all the most respected people in the world 
um, tend to be, you know, scientists, people who've won the Nobel Prize for atomic fusion or fission or whatever, all that stuff. And so they're the ones who, apart from Albert Einstein, um, they're the ones who, you know, kind of say, oh, it's all woo-woo, it's all nonsense. And so on some level, I suppose we absorb that bias. Mm -hmm, That it's not good enough. Yeah, Mm -hmm. and so we're still amazed. But, you know, that's why my, I guess my teacher said to me, test it, test it, test it, because you you just have to have have personal experience with it. And you start to go, I don't understand it. But this actually works. Right. And, the and evidence is there yeah. and it's yeah. constantly there. Yeah. I kind of like being surprised. I love, I still love the feeling of wow and the awe and the reverence and the whole like, ah, oh, because in that moment, I am so connected to spirit and I am so in reverence. And I know that I know I'll fall asleep at some point again, but boy, oh boy, in these moments, see, like there's that sense of like, see, it works. Yeah. <laughs> I think I would honestly feel like I would like to be able to take it more for granted. But I also think that that awe and that joy is actually part of it as well. It helps us too. manifest. But part of me is I like, mean, come on, do I still need to be amazed every time? Like how many times do I have to be <laughs> oh, amazed yes, yes. by the fact that this works? <laughs> well, because also as teachers we have this sort of responsibility, don't we? We're teaching this stuff. And, you know, you want but to make I actually sure you're not people. misleading people. But I also teach people to be amazed. I tell them, be amazed when it happens because we will, this is real, but the reality that calls us is also very powerful and seductive. And it tells us that some, I mean, I know this is real. There's no question. I am, I do take it for granted that it's real, but when I actually see things culminate and come together, like the synchronicities always blow my mind because it's like, I could not have made this up. Right. So that's kind of fun. Um, but I do understand what you mean. Wouldn't it be great if our entire society just expected this, that we were all Maybe working that's what I young. mean. Yeah. That everybody I, I was agree. just like, this is how it works guys. You know, Take it or leave it. You can sit there drinking beer, eating pizza, watching TV, or you can get out there and make magic, you know, or, you know, you can do a bit of both or whatever. Magic is real and both of us know it. I know. Now let's talk about eclipses because I think they are always very fascinating. So what are they and how can we best work with eclipses? And what's the difference between a solar and a lunar eclipse? Okay, so a solar eclipse is an eclipse that takes place at the time of the new moon and a lunar eclipse is the eclipse that takes place at the time of the full moon. And the way I learned to remember that was by saying, so it's S for solar, solar eclipse. I used to say, it's a new moon. So I would remember it's a new, that, it's a new moon. So S, solar eclipse, new moon. Um, okay, so eclipses are like just another thing all together in a way they're like I I actually didn't even write about them in moonology and I and I must write about them very soon um (laughs) they're uh they're they're like everything on a whole new level so everything we've said on steroids um one of my favorite expressions was from a um I said that there hadn't been that many astrologers who'd done what I'm doing working with the moon There was one woman who did some amazing work and I read all her books, which are these very little thin volumes you can get from the American Astrology Association. Her name was uh, Sophia Mason. It's like Sophia, but they pronounced it Sophia. She's passed away now. But in one of her books, which I think was Forecasting with Eclipses, um, Mm. she said, think of it like this, if it's a new moon and you know, it hits your Jupiter or whatever, you might find $10. If it's a new moon eclipse and it hits your Jupiter in your second house, whatever, you'll find $100. So it's like that. So it just amplifies everything. Yes, but for better or worse, obviously, because, you know, if if it's a difficult period in your life and you're not really rising to the challenge and you get a difficult new moon on your Saturn or whatever, you know, it can, it can, just be you know in more intensely challenging but you know sure. basically eclipses just amplify everything oh that's very interesting because people talk about it's eclipse season and then it's like okay what does that mean 
<laughs> and then you get all these really complicated. This is a great way. Oh, it's that it intensifies things. Yes. Now, does it intensify things according to the sign the moon is in? Or is it much more complicated than that? Yeah, no, it's much more complicated than that. Just to, to mm-hmm. talk, speak to the fact of eclipse season. So basically eclipses uh, always come in at least pairs. So an eclipse season right. would be the time between the first eclipse and the last eclipse of the year. But, uh, and you and they usually we have two eclipse seasons a year and you can get up to seven eclipses in one year. But, you know, like this year we've only got four, I think. Um, it doesn't really matter what sign it's in. What it does matter is, is it uh, squaring Pluto, which is difficult, uh, or is it harmonising with Venus, which is lovely, or is it hitting your ascendant, which is going to be really personal, you're really going to feel it, or is it, you know, opposing mm-hmm. your Mars, in which case, you know, it's going to fire you up. So, you know, like on the one hand, it's a bit like I said, there are three ways to work with the new moon. There are three, you know, you can apply the same rules to an eclipse like either just be aware that there's a big portal for change opening up so it can i mean everybody now i think has seen that film sliding doors if it's not getting so well i loved that younger people haven't seen it it's very much like that it's about um i think of it a bit like uh you know a door that's kind of going sideways and you have to jump through and wherever you jump through is going to affect where you end up and eclipses are like that they're like portals that open up and you either jump mm-hmm. through or you don't um that's a risk especially with a new moon eclipse with a full moon eclipse often it's time to release something it can be something mm-hmm. difficult like some negativity some fear a bad habit a bad relationship a bad job mm-hmm. anything like that so i think of, and you probably might as well because you're a fellow cancerian or moon child as right. i like to call it but i think of uh, full moon eclipse is a little bit more challenging because mm-hmm. often it's time to let something go, um, whereas new moon eclipses are kind of exciting because it's the start of something. It's not always true, though. Sometimes an eclipse will just, you know, hit your chart and, you know, sometimes for better, sometimes for more challenging. But eclipses are amazing and really, really worth paying attention to. Oh, I love that. That's really cool. Okay, so let's talk about moonbeams and the power of moonlight. Do you ever create your own moon water? And if so, what do you use it for? Okay, so I create moon water from time to time. And uh, I will just uh, leave a a jar of water or a bowl of water out somewhere because I'm in London. We have foxes left, right and centre in the garden, so you have to leave it somewhere. The foxes aren't going to tip it over or drink it all. And you let all the moonbeams from particularly the full moon uh, come down and, and sort of infuse it. And I will use it for things like running a bath, uh, you know, putting it in my bath or um, watering the plants. Basically, they're the two main things I'll use it for. Um, But, you know, I have to say, number one, it's not astrology, okay? This is something I (laughs) learned about from people on my Facebook page, you know, who talked about it. And I'm like, oh, moon water, that sounds good. What's that? Uh, so that's something <laughs> I've, I've learned about through my my readers. Does it charge something? Does it give you a special gift to the moon water? I mean, honestly, I think that you'll get just as good results by going out and sitting under the full moon. Um, right. You know, but something very interesting about moonbeams, uh, that's what I was going to say, is uh, I don't know if you ever knew George Lizos, who worked for um, Hay House in London for quite a few years and eventually quit yeah. uh, and went off to be a spiritual teacher in his own right. He's an amazing guy. And he said to me once, think about moonlight, Yasmin. It's the light of the sun, right, which is masculine. Mm very yang is the sun, bouncing off the moon, which is very feminine and about the goddess like we talked about. Mm -hmm. So when we get the moonbeams down here on earth, we're actually getting the yin and the yang, the yin of the moon and the yang of the sun, and it's like the complete picture. And Mm -hmm. I think that's why moonbeams are so special. But I would say, yes, make moon water. Why not? You know, if you want to. (laughs) I want to. But get get yourself out under the moonbeams as well because I Uh do think it must have a very balancing effect because of how it's created, in my humble opinion. So what do you wish more people knew about the moon? 
I wish that more people knew that they have the power to create their life using the moon as a cosmic timer. And so Mm -hmm. by setting your intentions at the new moon and releasing it all at the full moon, you can actually start to shape your life no matter what's happened to you so far, where you are, where you've grown up, how you're feeling, how stuck you feel, how powerful you do or don't feel, whatever, you can actually change your life once you start to do these practices. And I feel like um, I feel like they're kind of heaven sent practices mm-hmm. that, that, you know, uh, one thing we haven't touched on is that people used to do this for thousands of years until they stopped because they started to burn us alive at the, at the stake in the village square with our families watching and they started to drown us and hang us talking about the witch trials 500 yes, yes, years ago yes. where, you know, anything between thousands and millions of women were, were killed for doing this. So we stopped doing mm-hmm. it. So I'd like people to be able to remember that they actually have this power and that they're no longer going to be burned at the stake for using their powers. Oh, I just love that. I love that. Oh, what a great conversation. So let's pull a card together to see if there's anything else the Wooniverse wants us to talk about. Do do you have your Moonology card deck? I actually, uh, you know what? I have one card on my deck, on my desk today, and I'm going to just... Okay, what is it? I'm just going to say that this is the reason why I have this random one card on my desk. (laughs) Okay. If you're watching this or listening to this, it's for you. All right? Perfect. You ready? I'm ready. It actually says you and your family are safe. Oh, isn't that interesting? Isn't that beautiful? That so is beautiful. If you're listening to this or you're watching this, this is your message. You and your family you are safe. Your family There's a reason why it's on my desk. Like I should have all my decks on my desk when I'm talking to you and I don't because I've just got back from traveling. No, that's beautiful. I love that. Now I'm going to pull a card from my latest deck, the Dreamweavers Oracle. And the, the question I'm asking, is there any other subject? Now we have safety as a subject and family, right? So let's look okay. at a subject that this card deck would like us to talk about. Um, and I have, oh, when a witch must drink their brew. Hey, that's so good. Cause that's I'm what we're talking it. about. I know. Oh yeah. Okay, read so it, read it, read it. I'm going to read it. Cause this is, this is something that we can both comment on. All right. So it's being unapologetic, unapologetically comfortable in who you are, trusting and knowing your own magic, i.e. plus the moon. Um, uh, being authentic and inspired, the courage to own your values and who you are, not succumbing to the spell of society. I mean, so you says, literally you... just drew that, did you? Yeah. It's extraordinary because that's literally what I was trying to explain before. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So that is really, that's what I think the exclamation mark is what the universe wants us to really underline that we have to acknowledge that there is a spell. There is this conditioning that creates, for example, us falling asleep at the wheel because we're like, we're not being seen as serious or that this that has existed for thousands of years that we were killed for, right? Women were killed for, for working with the moon, et cetera. This is something that exists. This is part of our natural magic that all of us have. And you teach us how to work with that. And I think that's a uh, a phenomenal service that you give to all of us, Yasmin. Thank you, Colette. And I also get a personal message from that card because, you know, I'm sitting here saying I'm still amazed and I feel like I shouldn't be. And that's kind of like relates to that card. It's like we have to drink our own brew. We have to go, you know, like, and especially if we go through tough times, even anybody out there listening who's, a, you know, a light worker, a witch, a moonologer, whatever, uses your oracle cards, my oracle cards, whatever. You know, we have to drink our own brew. We have to believe in ourselves, even despite all these so-called learned people who think we're crazy. <laughs> I love this. Okay. This has been so good. We're going to switch gears now and travel into another dimension of the Wooniverse called the Tea Time After Party, a place where we kick up all the fun. Joining us now is our executive producer, Connie Deletti. So we're going to have some fun. Yasmin, are you ready, you two? Woo! Ready. <laughs> <laughs> so ready. Wow. Okay. Actually, Connie, why don't you start and ask Yasmin our first fun question? Oh, for sure. Okay. So you're offered a trip to the moon on the next SpaceX flight. Do you take it? 
Yes. <laughs> Yes. Oh my goodness. My okay. husband's in Paris right now, and he'd have to come back really quickly and look after yeah. our son. But yeah, I'm off. You're off. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. Um, okay, uh, if you could trade lives with one person for one day, living or or crossed over, who would you choose and why? I think that I would. Um, Okay, I, I've got a few in my head. I think I'd be Nadia Comaneci on the day she scored her perfect 10 at the Montreal Olympics, just to know what that oh, felt like. Wow. <laughs> oh, wow. That's a really good, good. I, I, I love never how specific. specific. <laughs> That's so specific. <laughs> but you know, when like think about that, it's that sense of feeling accomplished in such a way that is worldwide and global, and it really yeah. shows that spirits worked through her and all the hard yeah. work she put into it. And nobody imagine. ever even thought it was possible because you no. know they didn't even have the scoreboards and all. I, I've always been fascinated yeah. by her, and I think if I could, yeah, I also wouldn't mind being Madonna for a day just to know what that's like. <laughs> Just cause, just cause. Yeah, why not? Am right? I like supposed to say I'd like to be, you know, the Pope or something a bit more worthy? I'm just being honest. Now, why is that worthy? That's your, <laughs> you're funny. I, <laughs> Madonna's so worthy. That all of these. That are, is worthy, yeah, girl. Of that course, is worthy. More than worthy. Mm -hmm. I more love more that. More. Okay, love Connie, your turn. <laughs> okay, so if you had to listen to one song for the rest of your life, any time you turn on the radio, there it was. <laughs> What would it be? <laughs> Into the Mystic by Van Morrison. <gasps> I love Beautiful. that song. Love okay. That song. Wow. Love that song. This is like, oh my God. <laughs> you are so prepared for these questions. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm really not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is so great. Um, do you have a talent that others might find unusual? I can kind of play the flute. Oh, wow. Cool. Okay. A float yeah, I actually know. learned in the pandemic, so it's a new talent, a new I skill. Like that. I, I, like that. I can speak in burpish. Oh, oh I can speak French. Oh my goodness. I can say your name in burp. Excellent. Let's hear it. <laughs> and I will never do that in burp in public. Mm. I've yet to hear this language though. I mean, I think we need a whole other episode on this. Just saying. Just saying. Just saying. Um, okay, so you are banned from the library. Why? <laughs> Collecting question. moon water from the east trough outside yeah, of the window. Moon water all over the carpets. Yeah. <laughs> trying to lift the energy in there. Mm. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> what a noble reason. Okay. Yes, That's all I'm very saying. noble. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, last question. If you could be wildly successful in another profession, what would you choose? Um, easy, being a screenwriter. Mm -hmm. Well, what if that, I think that could actually happen. Yeah. <laughs> like, be quite I'd, love to do that. I'd love to I've do that. I've always seen mm -hmm. that, that you're going to end up doing something like that. Yeah. Honest I'd to God. To, I, I would love to be able to do you know, films about astrology and about creating yeah. your own We're like reality. having a whole thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, well, you're such a good writer. Yeah, thank you. For so real. You. Like, for real. <laughs> so are you. Well, thank you. But, like, for real, for real, for real. Well, this has been so great. So great. I've been so happy to have you on the show to learn more about Yasmin and all of her offerings, which are many. You can visit her at yasminboland.com and you can also catch her on her podcast called Mainly Moonology. And as always, you can find a transcript of this episode, quotes, all the links, and so much more on our show notes page. So go to itwpodcast.com or click the link in this episode's description. This was so much fun. Thanks for joining us, Yasmin. You were awesome. It was so nice, Colette. Thank you. And thank you all to all your team. So what did we learn today? I mean, this conversation was fascinating and really fantastic. And what really hit me is the reclaiming of the moon. Because when Yasmin talked about how women were burnt at the stake and all through the witch trials, et cetera, for actually practicing with the moon, this is such an important 
just such an important, important thing for us to consider. The moon is for everybody. You know, it's always been there and it's, it's, it's been a tradition that's been it baked into our bones um, since time immemorial. So we need to remember where we come from and that drinking our own brew, trusting in our own magic. It's so, it's so true. So until next time, thanks for listening. I'm Colette Baron reed Be well. Mm-hmm.